FAA SpaceX Starship Investigation. Let's get into it. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much once again joining me for Tea Time. Today we have a little bit of misty morning and that is it. I hope you're joining me with your cup of tea, maybe a cup of coffee, hanging out, talking space, SpaceX, Starlink, Linux, a whole bunch of good tech. Today is going to be a Starship Day, SpaceX Day, and the FAA hasn't put a formal conclusion out. They are investigating, but there is, let's say, some agreement about what happened. When we were watching together Starship launch or IFT-9, I guess you can get rid of the IFT now and just call it Test Flight 9, however you want to do it. Either which way, Test Flight 9 ended up a failure in big air quotes. And the reason being, of course, it blew up. The Starship blew up and also the Super Heavy. And I'll get into that in this video a little bit. It was still successful because they got a lot of information. And that's what's going on right now. They are iterative in nature. They are iterating, 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 and then innovating. So that's the way SpaceX works. Anyways, I was reading some articles. I want to bring this to your attention. What's going on over there with the FAA going forward? What did they find out so far? What are they doing and all this kind of thing? So we'll go through this. And then down below, I want to hear from you. What do you think about all this? What do you think is going to happen? Are they going to be able to launch in this absolute crazy cadence that they're allowed to launch now? They can launch twice a month, not like before. It was five times for a year, right? They only had five times. That's it. Now they moved it up to 25 times. That's twice a month with one left over. That's pretty damn good. So are they going to be able to keep that cadence up based on any type of mishaps like what just happened the other day with, once again, test flight nine? Anyways, it starts out by saying, Starship Flight 9 mishap prompts FAA investigation. What we know so far. On May 27, 2025, SpaceX's latest test flight of Starship Flight 9 ended in a partial failure, prompting a formal mishap investigation by the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA. While SpaceX has made impressive strides with its massive two-stage launch system, this most recent attempt proved just how complex and risky pushing the boundaries of spaceflight can be. A rough day at Space Base. The launch began smoothly from Starbase, SpaceX's private launch site in Boca Chica, Texas. Starship stacked atop the powerful Super Heavy booster, lifted off as planned, and roared towards orbit. The initial ascent phase seemed nominal, but trouble began around six minutes into the mission during the super heavy landing burn. That's when things went south. The booster designed to be reusable failed to execute its return maneuver correctly. It ultimately exploded, an event SpaceX has since acknowledged occurred within their planned risk envelope. That's very important. Because this was an expected possibility during test flights, the FAA is not investigating that portion of the mission. Trouble in the upper stage. More concerning was what happened next. The Starship's upper stage, intended to reach orbit and conduct re-entry testing, encountered a serious problem, losing control due to a propellant leak. The vehicle tumbled and failed to complete its mission tumbled, like exploded. <laughs> it ultimately disintegrated during re-entry over the Indian Ocean. Despite the dramatic outcome, all debris landed within the expected safety corridor. No injuries or damage on the ground were reported. The FAA steps in. The FAA swiftly announced that a formal mishap investigation had been opened. Their focus is solely on the failure of the Starship, upper stage. SpaceX will be required to determine the root cause, propose corrective actions, and implement changes before any future flights can be approved. This process is standard procedure whenever a launch vehicle is lost mid-mission. It ensures that the future flights can proceed safely, both for the public and for any payloads or astronauts that may one day fly aboard. A setback, but not a showstopper. 
Despite the high profile failure, this is still part of the iterative approach SpaceX is known for. Test, fail, learn, and iterate. That's been their model from the start. While the public sees the explosion, engineers behind the scenes sees data, lessons, and opportunity. The company remains confident that with refinements and investigation outcomes, future flights will become increasingly reliable. I do believe that to be the case because once again, like I said before, SpaceX has done this from the very beginning. They just iterate and iterate and iterate and then blow crap up and then iterate and iterate and then blow th that's just what they do. That just simply works for them. In comparison to NASA over the many years, they just iterate, iterate, they test using computers and they test like on the ground and they test. On, they never know what's going to happen when they actually launch. And I think that that is a problem. I love what SpaceX does by constantly blowing these things up because they can push the absolute nature of the structure. Can it handle it? A perfect example is with Super Heavy. Super Heavy did not need to explode on this mission. They did what they did to push it to the maximum tolerance for re-entry. So instead of coming in very tightly at like, let's say a 15% decline or incline, however you want to look at it, and come in really tight, just like a, let's say a diver would coming into the water, just like this, right? It really splits the water so it doesn't take a lot of impact on the vehicle. But instead they came in like this, almost like a belly flop. That kind of hurts, right? Well, that's what ended up happening. It slows down the vehicle a lot because it's using the vehicle and all of the atmospheric drag to slow it down, but it causes a lot of vibration and heat and all kinds of nastiness to the ship. So of course, they're going to push it to the absolute limit, see how much the structure can hold. And at the very end, they found that they hit the limit because during that, back burn, that landing burn, it just failed. And that was the end of it, it blew up. So that's okay because they need to know how much they can belly flop this thing coming in to slow it down. The belly flop that they did slowed it down by over one, I think it's 1000 kilometers. The speed was massively reduced, but it caused a lot of damage in so doing also. So it's something that they need to work on and at least they know they can come at 15% is not a problem, at 30, 40%, eh, it's a problem, right? Unless they make provisions for that steep, steep decline or incline, however you want to look at it. So that is what they do. Once again, iterate, iterate, iterate. And then finally, they innovate. The problem that I have with this, and I said it during the flight, and I said, you know, this has happened not just once, this has not happened twice, this has now happened three times, where there's a propellant leak, there is a fuel leak, the propellant ends up causing the explosions, right? This happened on seven, this happened on eight, and now it happened again on nine. And that is a big, big thing. And the reason why it's big is because remember, this is an innovation. It is a move from block one to block two. And when you move from the old, which is working, to a block two, where now you actually change the structure, the structure is longer, it is taller. There is 25% more propellant on board. Also, the plumbing has changed, obviously, to take into consideration or account for the length of the vehicle. Things have changed. And whenever you have these changes, you're going to have these anomalies. And I think the major, the biggest anomaly that they're getting into or they're seeing is this harmonic problem where the ship starts shaking really tightly and then the ship starts going more and more and more until it's slapping okay, and just pulling cables and pulling fuel lines out because the whole thing is vibrating so much. Do I know that for sure? No, but that's what I'm speculating. I used to stunt, right, a motorcycle. And when we used to land at high speeds off a wheelie, right, if you didn't land absolutely perfect, you would end up with a slapper, right? And sometimes they call it a death slapper. But what that basically is, is the tire comes down slightly off center and it'll start vibrating, right? Harmonic, right? And that vibration will start out tight like this and then get bigger and bigger and bigger until you're doing this down the road, okay? Until it 
shoot you off, okay? So it's the same type of thing. Also, you could look at it as a tuning fork. When you hit a tuning fork, it vibrates very tightly at the very beginning. So it's like a very high pitch sound. So it's really, really tight vibration. And as it slows down, you can see the vibration start getting bigger and bigger and bigger if you were able to see the vibration. It's the same type of thing here. What they can do is obviously slow down the vehicle to stop the vibration, but can they do it when they're trying to accelerate into orbit? It's a little bit harder to do. You could do the same thing with a motorcycle, but I just don't think that that's viable. I think what they need to do is harden the craft, go into the locations that this harmonic problem is happening, all right, and then make them stronger make them more resilient or resistant to that harmonic shaking, let's call it. So I think that's what's gonna end up happening because if not, they're gonna have to go to a block three and change the whole thing up again because this block two is just simply not working. It's either the shape, it's the size, it's the plumbing, it's something on board that's making this thing shake and just tear itself up. That's what I think. I could be wrong. All right, once again, I am speculating here. Down below, I would love to hear from you. I would love to know what you think about all this. Because, so what I did is I wrote down what exactly happened on flight seven, flight eight, and flight nine. So it's not me just talking, I actually wrote it down, word for word, what ended up happening. So on flight seven, January 16th, 2025, the first block two starship, ship 33, experienced a propellant leak due to an unexpected harmonic vibrations, leading to a sustained fire and eventually the vehicle's destruction. Once again, what was it? A propellant leak, a fuel leak due to what? Harmonic vibrations. Flight 8, this is March 14th. The second Block 2 starship, this is Ship 34, suffered from a propellant leak, again attributed to harmonic vibrations, resulting in the loss of control and mission failure. That was Flight 8. And then finally now, Flight 9, May 27th, 2025, the third Block 2, this is once again Block 2, not Block 1. The third Block 2 starship, which is Ship 35, encountered a propellant leak that caused a loss of control and the disintegration upon re-entry. So this is something that has been happening continuously. This is something that's happening, this propellant leak has been happening with that innovation from block one to block two. Like I said, over this over the course of months, I said there's something wrong with the design of this ship. They did something that is causing it. Remember this, guys. As things get longer, vibration gets worse. Shorter things don't vibrate. Let's say, uh, I don't know, a guitar string. You get a short string, you pluck it, it's like beep like really tight. You get a long one, you hear bong, and it's like vibrating like this. So as things get bigger and longer, you're going to end up sustaining more vibration, more harmonic problems. So how do you fix that? That's the question. I'm not a engineer, so I don't have an answer, but I'm speculating that is the problem and it's something that they're going to need to address or they're just simply going to have to go back to a block one size and plumbing and then now maybe put your Raptor 3s in there instead of your Raptor 2s and do some other things. SpaceX wants to go larger and larger and larger, but maybe they hit a point where they can't go any bigger until they figure out what they need to do to, let's say, mitigate these vibrations. So what say you? Down below, I would love to hear your thoughts about this. If you enjoy the content, throw the video a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe if you're not. If you are, thank you, I appreciate that. Click this notification button here so I go live when a new video comes out, you'll be notified of it immediately. And if you wanna give back to the channel, there's a little thanks button. Thank you, YouTube, for the button. Click on thanks, give a dollar or two if you like. If not, it's perfectly fine. The video is still free. Consider becoming a member of the channel. That would be even better. And if you want more SpaceX Starlink specific content, I have just under 500 videos now. Over the last 48 months, I've made these for you. I'll put a link here. Go check them out when you're done watching this video. I would really appreciate that. There's a lot of good stuff. Helpful how-tos, tips, tricks, what to do, what not to do, what to buy, what not to buy, and of course the why behind all of it because this channel is about the what? The why. Anyways, guys, many blessings to you and your family. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay connected, hopefully through SpaceX Starlink, and we'll see you in the next one. Love you guys.